Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining our JCU webinar series. Uh, my name is Victoria Katainen. I'm an associate professor in English and writing here at James Cook University. It's my sincere honor to be your MC today. Uh, firstly, and most importantly, we wish to acknowledge country. And it is in the spirit of reconciliation here at JCU that we do so. We acknowledge the valuable contribution that Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples continue to make not only to this university, but also to the broader community in North Queensland and beyond. Um, as a late arrival here, I humbly acknowledge the Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first inhabitants of this nation and pay my respects to the traditional owners and elders past and present of the land on which we stand today here on the Bebeguyanga campus, the Bindal and Wolgarukba people. And given the nature of the talk we are about to hear today, I would also like to acknowledge and pay my deep respects to the people of the Maralinga and Emu fields lands represented by the Maralinga Jarucha. This afternoon, we're about to hear from our beloved JCU colleague, award-winning author and academic Elizabeth Tynan. Liz previously wrote Atomic Thunder, The Maralinga Story, for which she won the Prime Minister's Literary Award for Australian History and the Chass Australia Prize for um, 2017. She is also the coordinator um, of the professional development program for the JCU Research School. Liz draws on her extensive experience as a science journalist and atomic history researcher to bring light in this webinar to the forgotten fate of Emu Field long after the mushroom clouds dispersed. Her book will be officially released in May next year. So just some housekeeping before we get started. This webinar is being recorded. Liz will talk um, for approximately 35 minutes and then we'll have time for questions afterward. Please feel welcome to type your questions and comments into the Q&A box on your Zoom control panel as they occur to you throughout the presentation. We will monitor them and I will address these at the end of the formal proceedings. So please welcome Liz Tynan with our book preview, The Secret of Emu Field. Thank you so much, Victoria, and what a great privilege and pleasure it is for me to be here to talk to you about the most extraordinary story. I am very um, excited to be able to bring you the story of Inu Field. Many of you have heard, no doubt, of uh, the much more prominent British atomic test site at um, Maralinga in South Australia. Um, but I don't think many of you will have heard of Inu Field. And Emu Field has tended to be something of a, of a footnote to the history of British atomic tests in Australia. But I have discovered in my research over the past few years that it has its own unique story and its own unique qualities. Emu Field actually predated Maralinga by three years. So the, the tests that went on there were actually very early um, British atomic bomb devices. And I would say, and through my research, I think it's true to say that, um, that the EMU field tests, which were set up and conducted extremely quickly and without any consultation, of course, there was no consultation with um, the Aboriginal people in the area or anyone else. I would say that there is an argument for um, the tests, the atomic tests at EMU field being in some ways more damaging are uh, more destructive to Aboriginal life and culture, and indeed to, to the lives and futures of the military personnel who are involved as well, than even the tests at, at Maralinga. You will see on your screen a very um, stunning image of Totem 1. This was the first of the tests held at Emu Field on the 15th of October, 1953. And as I will tell you about in this very brief sort of introduction to, to this history, Totem 1 did uh, a huge amount of damage. Uh, in, an mo in an instant, lives were changed because of the cloud that you can see there in front of you. You will also notice that, um, that this photo was taken by a representative of the media and media were present at Emu Field. Um, interestingly though, the media and other 
people who were not directly associated but were allowed to visit the test were brought to emu field in an aircraft that had its windows covered so that no one could see exactly where they were going and they were whisked away very soon after that uh, that cloud disappeared so it was a very very secret um, operation operation totem at emu field but i would like to begin both physically and metaphorically with dawn at Maralinga on the day of my trip to Emu Field. Um, in a sense, I was moving from a place that I understood and knew quite a bit about, Maralinga, to a place that was fairly sketchy in my mind, was not something that uh, I had actually known very much about. I had focused my efforts in the past on, um, particularly on Maralinga. And so on that day that I traveled from Maralinga um, to Emu Field, I was traveling into the unknown. It's only, it's less than 200 kilometers um, from Mar Maralinga to Emu, but the trip took five and a half hours each way. So you can imagine that that was a very, very long day. One of the, the days that live in my memory um, one of the days where I learnt more in 12 hours than I, I have learnt at any other time. It was the most extraordinary day. And can I get you to notice this photo, which was taken by my brother, Andrew, who was with me on that trip. And I'll just say quickly that most of the photos that you see in this presentation were taken by Andrew, except those that are otherwise indicated. This photo, which was taken as we were travelling north, from Maralinga village towards Emu Field, that it struck me as looking just like an atomic bomb on the horizon. And it was a poignant reminder that despite the peace and beauty of the surroundings that we were traveling through, that this place had a very violent history. So it really stands out. That moment, that photo was taken, I, I'm living it again, just looking at it. The lands are back in Aboriginal hands, so um, the Maralinga lands, which include um, Emu Field, are now back in Aboriginal hands, and um, they're managed by Maralinga Jarrett Jarrett Council. Um, and the wonderful Oak Valley Rangers fulfil the requirements of the various land management plans in place. The um, Aboriginal owners of this land take their responsibilities extremely seriously. And the Oak Valley Rangers are um, performing great acts of, of healing upon that place. Um, it's a wonderful band of people. I was fortunate to travel in that car with Ranger Coordinator Shane, who um, I don't think I ever stopped asking him questions on the whole trip. Uh, and he never seemed to tire of answering them while still negotiating the sand drifts that were on that road and the difficult terrain that he was traversing. Um, he was the most extraordinary person and I owe him a great debt of gratitude. I just want to give you a bit of an idea in case you don't know um, where we're talking about. That white arrow points to the warmer prohibited area. The warmer prohibited area is a very, very large part of South Australia and it was declared uh, in the late 1940s um, because the British were testing their rocket technology out of Woomera. And Emu Field and Maralinga are within that territory. Um, they're on the sort of western reaches of that territory. So that gives you a bit of an idea and shows where we were in relation to um, Adelaide, which incidentally, Adelaide is my, my hometown. I was born there. And um, a lot of this story has it's personal to me um, certainly members of my family were I wasn't born then but members of my family were around at the time that these tests were, were taking place the road to emu is the most extraordinary drive I've already mentioned I was lucky to share that drive with Shane we had a convoy actually of three vehicles altogether going to emu um, and we stopped midway at Len Bedell's tree. Some of you will know the name Len Bedell, um, the legendary surveyor of, of Central Australia. Um, this tree is exactly midway between Maralinga and Emu Field. Um, and you can see there that the landscape is dominated by beautiful mulga trees and red sand and that vivid dome of a blue sky. It was almost too much. It was 
saturating the, the senses. Um, and I just want to share with you a tiny excerpt from my book, my forthcoming book, just to describe what this, what this says to me, this particular tree. So the shape of a Gothic window has been hewn into the sturdy trunk of the tree and filled in with white paint, giving off a faint echo of a medieval church. The word emu has been incised into the Gothic window and below sits an aluminium plaque, not the original, which was stolen years ago, that points back 60 miles to Maralinga and forward 60 miles to Emu. One can easily imagine Bedell and his men resting here during their surveying and road building labours and feeling the need to mark their stay. After sharing billy tea and tin corn beef, laughing all the while at Bedell's jokes, they would have packed up their things and moved on, taking readings and measurements, placing a Western grid over ancient land. Now, I'm not sure if grandpa was there the day they carved that, um, that Gothic window into the tree, but my grandfather was a member of Len Bedell's crew. And so that's one of the personal connections that I have to the story and um, one that gives it extra resonance for me. This is me and my dear colleague Leander standing at the lookout, on the lookout at Emu Field, turned away from the, um, the direction of the actual bombs, um, but looking down from the lookout. And um, this was a surreal moment to me. I was sharing the same ground where um, the people who I'd been researching, particularly Sir William Penny, the architect of the British bomb, who I'll introduce you properly to in a moment, that I was standing on the same ground as he was, and I was able to share it with, with dear colleagues and also with my brother, um, who came along and took such wonderful photos. My book tells the story of Operation Totem at Emu Field in October 1953, and it goes quite a lot into its political and scientific context and, of course, its aftermath. The two totem atomic bombs that were detonated at Emu Field were designed to compare different kinds of nuclear fuel. Now, this is all connected with um, the, the broader history of the war and Britain's contribution to the atomic bomb through the Manhattan Project and the subsequent banning of cooperation between America and other countries through the infamous McMahon Act um, that made it illegal for American scientists to work with scientists from any other country on nuclear weapons. It was all to do with spies and it's all terribly exciting, but the McMahon Act had a, um, a, a kind of a ripple effect that meant that ultimately Britain chose to test its weapons in Australia. And another one of those rip ripples was the fact that it could not share um, US resources and knowledge and experience. And so it had to develop its own, but it had virtually no money after the war. It was uh, in fairly dire straits. And so um, that drove a lot of the decision-making around um, Operation Totem and the previous Operation Hurricane, which was held in Western Australia, which I won't really have time to touch on and may well, you might, find is the topic of my next book. Um, but certainly the decision making around Totem was very much to do with the fact that um, the, the British had few resources, had little money, as you'll find later, as I discuss, they were scrambling to get uranium. And Australia played a role in that and was able to um, uh, leverage um, it's uranium in, in a sense to, um, to get some of the things, not many, but some of the things that it wanted from the British. Um, so all of these, these bigger forces were coming to bear on what happened at Emu Field. The UK was trying to build atomic weapons on the cheap. As one book puts it, um, being, a top, being nuclear on a budget, that's what they were trying to do. And they were going to be having to use plutonium, which is created in a reactor, from a new reactor that was being built called Calder Hall. And the kind of 
that reactor was intended to produce plutonium for both military and civilian use, the first in the world that was actually able to do that. But because of its particular specifications, it was going to produce a particular kind of plutonium that contained more plutonium 240 than the existing reactor at wind scale. Now that, don't worry too much about the technicalities of that, but it is very significant to um, what they were trying to do at, um, at uh, EMU Field. Th that particular kind of plutonium could potentially make the weapons more unpredictable and they needed to test exactly what would happen when they exploded a weapon that contained a higher than desired level of plutonium 240. The fuel of choice for atomic weapons as opposed to thermonuclear weapons, hydrogen bombs, but these um, earlier atomic bombs, the, uh, the fuel of choice was plutonium 239. And that works well for, well in inverted commas for this kind of, uh, of purpose. But the fact that they were going to have around about 6% of plutonium 240 in their fuel meant that they had to test the reliability and the predictability of those weapons. So that's what Totem was really all about, making uh, weapons on the cheap using less than ideal fuel. Okay, so who made these decisions? Uh, here's a bit of a rogues gallery for you. Um, Winston Churchill, the great wartime prime minister, as you may be aware, lost the election at the end of the Second World War, but he came roaring back or toddling back, depending on how you look at it, uh, in October 1951. Now, the British bomb program had already developed quite a long way since then, since 1947, when a decision was made to build a British bomb. Clement Attlee was the British prime minister, the Labour prime minister who um, preceded Churchill. But in many ways, Churchill is considered to be the true atomic um, prime minister of that country. He um, gave the go ahead to the first two um, um, nuclear test operations in Australia. And he was um, a, a, a great enthusiast for it. And that's partly because of the next guy, Frederick Lindemann, um, known quite often as Churchill's bulldog or the atomic bulldog, uh, Lindemann was a, a Tory politician who held the position of paymaster general after Churchill came back in 51. And despite the name, which wouldn't necessarily suggest uh, responsibilities for matters atomic, in fact, he was heavily involved in uh, um, making decisions. He was a physicist himself, um, a, a very um, knowledgeable scientist, but quite an insider. He was also um, very, very keen for Britain to have its own weapon and not depend upon the Americans. Um, then we have Lord Portal, who had the rather ominous name of controller of atomic energy um, during the Clement Attlee years, um, distinguished military man from the Second World War, um, greatly influenced by the Nobel laureate in physics, Sir James Chadwick, who um, had a lot to do with the Manhattan Project. And Chad, Chadwick and Portal um, worked out the, the sort of physics parameters for the fuel based on what was likely to come out of Calder Hall. I spent a week at the Churchill Archives at Cambridge, and then I spent a bit of time, a bit less than a week, um, at Oxford, the Lindemann Archives at Nuffield College and the Portal Archives at Christchurch. Um, some of the most illuminating times I've spent in archives researching these characters. They are quite extraordinary. Then we have William Penny. Um, at, that, at the start, Dr. or Professor Penny, then Sir William Penny, and finally Lord Penny, who was the architect of the British bomb. Um, he um, was a, a brilliant physicist with two PhDs. Um, who was the leader of the British mission to the Manhattan Project. And uh, the weapons that he designed um, were the ones that were tested in Australia. And he presided over most of the test series in Australia, not all of them, but he was, he was there at Operation Totem at Emu Field. And then, of course, Robert Menzies, the Australian Prime Minister who'd, who'd uh, taken office in 1949, uh, very well disposed to the British when they came looking for atomic test sites, but not just out of patriotism and the 
allegiance to the mother country, but uh, for quite pragmatic reasons as well, which I'll touch on a bit later. But uh, these, these characters are quite important to the story. So is this the clay pan and this stunning photo taken by my brother just really brings out that the colour of the clay pan. The clay pan was the major factor for choosing Emu Field. Um, it's a very long, flat um, clay pan that aircraft can land on. Um, the site was actually named for the emu claw marks in the clay, although I have to say that you go to this area now, you don't see any animals, you don't see emus, you don't see kangaroos. Um, you might see the odd feral camel. Um, mostly what you see are sticky little flies that won't leave you alone. So I had to wear a veil over my head, otherwise it would have gone mad. Uh, I'm sure it was very much the case back in the day. Um, aircraft landed on the, the clay pan. It was not ideal and there were, it was quite risky to do that. Um, they did build an all-weather strip alongside the clay pan and you can see that there today. And this is me having a, um, a close look at the clay. Um, there was water coming up, seeping up into, um, from below um, and it was possible to see that in the clay. This is the view that Sir William Penny and his close colleagues saw from the lookout. You can see a, um, a dirt track that runs off, sort of heading off to the left there. Um, that is a, a dirt road that leads to one of the ground zeros. Um, a small group led by Sir William Penny viewed the two 7am bomb tests from the highest point of the site. Now, this is a very flat place. You know, Emu Field is a, uh, on a flat plain. Um, the lookout itself is not particularly high, but it was high enough to, uh, to see um, the, uh, the bomb test. They were 7 a.m., deliberately designed to be about just over an hour after dawn, which was deemed to be um, the right time um, for viewing. Um, and Totem 1 was detonated on the 15th of October. It was actually running about a week late. Um, because of weather conditions. And in fact, they went ahead on the 15th of October, even though the weather conditions were um, totally unsuitable. And in fact, they defied their own manual on this and went ahead despite the poor conditions. And as a result, a lot of people suffered from that. Totem 2, uh, a very experimental device, was um, detonated on the 27th of October, 1953. Now, you'll see Sir William Penny there in the middle um, uh, in his suit and tie in the middle of the, the desert. They've all got their ties on pretty much. Um, Emu Field was a military site, um, but it was kind of unusual um, in that it was very much run like a military site and, and quite deliberately so because um, the British government had taken advice from um, various people involved with the American tests to say that you can't have the scientists running it because they will um, run riot. You need the, the discipline of the military. And so there was this kind of combination of um, very much a military installation, but with the, uh, the scientists, the civilian scientists and the AWRE there stands for the Atomic Weapons Research Establishment which was part of the UK Ministry of Supply. So it was a civilian organisation in, in a funny sort of way. So Penny ran the weapons test, did all the design work, had a small band of scientists and technologists that he worked with. He oversaw the associated experiments as well. There were some experiments, including those conducted by a notorious character called Ernest Titterton, who worked for many years at the ANU as a um, professor of nuclear physics. Um, his story, we don't have time to go into today, but it certainly is an interesting one. And just another personal connection there, my father worked uh, with Ernest Titterton for many years at the ANU and knew him. Um, so Penny only arrived, oh, maybe two weeks before um, the first test. Um, before then, there'd been a frenetic period of activity to, to build the site. Um, the, the advance party only arrived in about February of 1953. And 
by October, they were ready to test nuclear weapons. It's quite an extraordinary feat, actually, how quickly they were able to build the site. Um, there was only a small um, group working there um, because of the limitations of the site, particularly um, the lack of water meant that it was never going to be as big uh, an installation as at Maralinga. At Maralinga, over the years that Maralinga was operational, something like 35,000 people stayed there. EMU was not like that at all. It was, it was a very transitory place. Um, and you can see here the, the small um, camp where they lived. It was all tents. They were staying in tents. Um, only about 300 could be at um, EMU at any one time. And um, the conditions were considered to be a hardship post, but all the accounts that I've read from the, um, from the primary record indicate that there was actually quite a lot of um, esprit de corps and quite a, a lot of high spirits at, at the camp. Um, during the time that the um, uh, RAAF people were building the camp, um, it was a particular squadron of the RAAF, that, um, the construction squadron that would base their building. Um, during that time, um, the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II occurred, and they even had a, a full-scale you know, ceremony and celebration of the, uh, the start of the new Elizabethan era. Um, and they had a special ration of beer brought in, and they played cricket, and they had... A, uh, their version of a 21 gun salute that I think used dynamite or something like that or something really dangerous. Um, so there was this sense of purpose about it and sense of uh, esprit de corps. Um, this tented city was very close to the clay pan, but some kilometres away from the actual test site. So there was uh, a separation between the two. Mind you, it's almost certain that some of the fallout from the second test in particular came close to the village. Um, by December of 53, just about everyone had left other than a few security police who stayed on. Um, it was a, 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 a desert mirage. It disappeared very, very quickly. <clears throat> but you can see here some of the, uh, the heavy equipment um, most equipment had to be flown in and landed on that clay pan. Um, there was no road from Woomera or from Adelaide uh, to bring things in. They did actually end up bringing some things by um, makeshift sort of road, including a Centurion tank. Uh, and that tank ultimately became notorious as the atomic tank. It was cleaned of its radiation and sent to Vietnam where people used it in Vietnam. Uh, so a lot of this construction gear, some of it was brought across country and some of it was brought in by transport aircraft and landed on the clay pan. Okay, totem one, secret guard. Um, a lot of the, um, the records, including photography, have been declassified. Um, I have to say though, that in December, 2018, so three years ago, the British government withdrew just about all the files I'm at, from public view from the archives in, in London. I'm very fortunate that I had been able to get to the archives, not just the National Archives at Kew, but to the other archives that I've mentioned um, before then. Um, because right at this moment, historians cannot access most of the um, the, the British files. They're under review. They've been under review for three years and there is no idea of when that period of under review will end. But I keep checking. I checked a few days ago. They are still not um, available again. And I have to wonder why. I'm not the only one wondering why. There are other historians who are working in this area who wonder why as well. But this is uh, a previously secret image. Um, they had camera... Um, camera towers set up all around the site and they also had uh, air crew taking um, shots as well. This is from a tower of um, a, a very short time after the detonation of Totem 1. And I, I love this quote, it stood over the desert like a grotesque tree and for a while until the wind seized it and distorted it and bent it to a random shape 
there was an unwilling, monstrous quality of grace about it. And that's the um, very eloquent British journalist, James Cameron, who, who was one of those people flown in in the camouflage plane, um, was able to witness that um, detonation and then was whisked away immediately afterwards. Um, I, I get what he says about that unwilling, monstrous quality of grace. And perhaps you might have seen that in that very first image I showed you of the totem one cloud. The totem one uh, experiment was notorious for creating what has become known as the black mist. And some of you may have heard of this person, Yami Lester, I'll quote him from his evidence given to the Royal Commission into British nuclear tests. He gave evidence in uh, 1985, yes, the 20th of April, 1985. He said, the old people were frightened. They reckon it was Mamu. It's a pretty hard word to try and translate into English, but it is something that could be a bad spirit or evil spirit or something that we're not quite sure what it is. Yami Lester was a child um, living at Wallatina um, at the time of uh, Totem One. Um, he much later gave evidence to the Royal Commission at Malabar, which is close to Wallatina. The Royal Commission actually went to Wallatina and Malabar and other places. Uh, he traveled around quite a bit to take evidence. Uh, and the Royal Commission um, was scathing of what the British did at um, in the field, certainly at Maralinga, also at Montebello Islands, at um, Western Australia. This photo was taken by Jesse Boylan. Um, it captures Yami so well. We lost Yami a few years ago, um, but he was a tireless advocate for people who were harmed by um, British nuclear tests in Australia. Totem One produced a menacing black cloud that rolled over the communities around Wallatina, which is about 170 kilometres to the northeast of Emu Field. This menacing cloud was kind of greasy and unlike, it was nothing like fog or rain or anything like that. It had this greasy quality and it had a particular smell. Some people said it smelt like a dead kangaroo. Other people said it smelt like kerosene. Um, it, kind of settled onto the vegetation and, be, and became sort of sticky stuff on, on the trees. It was very, very strange. And I talk in my new book about what we think it might have been. When I say we, there have been people who've examined this from different angles, whether it's scientific angle, um, there have been sort of judicial inquiries or attempts to understand what went on. Um, we don't really know. And in fact, the chapter that deals with this in my book is called The Unknowable Black Mist, because so much of it um, is mysterious. But I do, in the chapter, um, draw upon some of the studies and speculate a little about what it was. It caused sickness and most likely death among Aboriginal people. We have no baseline health data about the people living in that area um, to know exactly what damage it caused, but we do know that um, people were badly affected. Um, Yami himself later, um, in 1957, he lost the sight in one of his eyes. And then in 1965, he lost the sight in the other eye. So he became completely blind. Um, there is quite a bit of speculation about, um, about the causal links there too, but almost certainly the fact that he was exposed to this very dangerous substance in the mist caused a range of health problems that in a complicated way led to his blindness. But um, even he didn't know himself whether it was a direct causal link. The suffering caused to Australians, I believe, makes the ongoing secrecy around the exact nature of the totem bombs really hard to take. Um, the fact that the British have actually withdrawn records in recent times, records that used to be available and no longer available, I think that's that's wrong, and they should allow those records to be made public. Operation Totem left a terrible burden of anxiety for the people of the lands that continues to this day. Um, it's a terrible legacy. Totem 2, um, quite different 
meteorological conditions that day, um, wind shear, which broke the cloud up very quickly. Um, this test was not witnessed by journalists or other outsiders. Um, this was uh, a very highly secret device and remained so. Um, Frederick Lindemann, the atomic bulldog, said Totem 2 was an experiment which will probably fail, but which we must try because of the enormous advantage of it if it comes off. I don't know exactly what was in Totem 2, but I believe that it was a nuclear fuel with a high proportion of plutonium 240. But those of us who are not insiders may never know for sure. Okay, so you've heard of fallout. Um, here are a few things to flesh out that idea. The first quote is from Leslie Martin, who was a, a physicist and a defence science advisor who was very involved. He was an official observer at Operation Totem. He worked closely with Ernest Titterton on um, preparing a report on the safety aspects of Totem before it went ahead, a, a report that turns out to be quite inadequate. But he, was, he did brief Robert Menzies um, on the nature of the tests that were being held there. And this is part of that report. The volatilized products of an atomic explosion become airborne and being radioactive may on falling out create large areas of contamination which are biologically dangerous. Now this next quote is from a notorious report called A32 um, which was produced by the Atomic Weapons Research Establishment so it's an official um, not so much a report actually as a manual for how to um, uh, what sort of conditions would be suitable for testing, which the British authorities, led by William Penny, actually um, ignored. So even though in itself this report was um, inadequate, it, was, it would have been better than nothing if they'd heeded it, but they didn't. And I talk quite a bit about that in the book. But this is from this report. Once the contaminated particles have been thrown into the air, they will be dispersed by the wind and fall to the ground under gravity. Where they fall will contaminate the ground. And if this contamination is heavy enough, it could conceivably present a danger to the health of any person in the near vicinity. Now, don't think that people in Townsville were exempt from this. Fallout from both devices traveled 2,500 kilometers to Townsville. And radioactivity was also detected in Bowen and elsewhere along the North Queensland coast from both of these explosions in 1953. Um, it travelled right across the continent and left fallout along the way. Now, this photo might not look very dramatic to you, but it always gives me the chills. It's actually taken from film footage of Operation Totem, official footage that was created by the Atomic Weapons Research Establishment. Um, this shows a RAF, uh, sorry, Royal Air Force, a British Canberra piloted by Wing Commander Geoffrey Denon, that, and it was flying into the atomic cloud six minutes after de detonation, where it was severely buffeted by turbulence. On board was, there were three people on board. Um, so there was Denon and there was also a navigator, but there was also a radiologist called Group Captain Dennis Wilson from the Royal Air Force Central Medical Establishment, who was the architect of the Air Force side of, of the test program. And I talk quite a bit about his role in my book. The crew was exposed for a brief time to potentially lethal amounts of ionizing radiation. Uh, levels that are almost unimaginable, but only for a few seconds. So they, they did survive. The quote from, from Denon um, was, the cloud as we drew nearer looked distinctly nasty in that very British understatement. Royal Australian Air Force crew in Lincoln's Dakotas and US crew in Super Fortresses were also involved in Totem. There's quite an Air Force story as well. Sorry, my phone keeps ringing. Um, so that Air Force, so the Air Force crew, the RAF, and particularly the RAAF crew, and I'm saying here quite definitely the ground crew were at more risk than the air crew, were exposed to a great deal of radiation. So 
as I've mentioned, the um, uh, Operation Totem was all contained within 1953. So from start to finish, um, it didn't sort of spill out on either side of that year. And it's renowned as the Marie Celeste of atomic test sites. Um, people just dropped everything and left. And Peace Officer Noel Williams, peace officers were security police, part of the forerunner to the federal police. And they were stationed at Emu Field and stayed there for a little while after Operation Totem. And this is a quote from one of his, uh, this is from his statement actually to the Royal Commission. He said, it was very obvious that the place had been deserted in a hurry. There were private letters and wristwatches on bedside tables. It really looked um, as uh, an officer had just said, get into a vehicle and people had left. There were half full glasses of water with little covering of dust on the surface of the water. Stories like this gave rise to um, the, the myth that um, they had to evacuate quickly because they were covered in radioactivity. Now, in fact, no evidence has been found of that, but it still remains a bit mysterious why they left glasses of water and wristwatches and um, plates with food still on them on the tables, why they just got up and left. It is a, uh, one of the strange aspects of the story. And certainly for a lot of people, that indicates that um, everyone who was present was um, had fallout drop on them. But as I say, I've found no evidence to support that. Now, um, I alluded to this, and I'm sorry about the, the text on the screen here, but it's, it's worth reading this. Um, because part of this story, and there's a chapter on it in my book, um, revolves around the uranium angle, which is really interesting. Um, because this was Australia's atomic bargaining chip, because we had uranium and the British and the Americans too, by the way, and others wanted it. Uh, and suddenly Australia found for a very brief moment, it found itself in the spotlight. So here's just a quote from the Rockhampton Morning Bulletin. It is strange that a discovery which has um, done more to give Australia additional world status than anything else can be named offhand has become the subject of a rowdy domestic political squabble. Australia finds itself courted by governments, visited by distinguished scientists, caught up in a stream of great world events by reason of the discovery of uranium over a wide tract of territory that does not exhaust the possibility of further finds. Almost overnight, we've emerged as a prospective major supplier of the precious and coveted ore, source of military power in the present and of industrial power in the not distant future. So that's a whole other story. I noticed that we are running out of time, so I won't dwell on that, but it's, I think, a fascinating um, insight into the reasoning behind the tests in Australia. Now, there's ongoing aftermath. Um, this is Karina Lester um, speaking at the United Nations, who said, many are still suffering today. The emotional, mental and physical suffering is felt by generations. We're constantly reminded of what has been taken away from us as a family and the suffering we've gone through. Karina, who is herself an activist, is Yami Lester's daughter. And she's associated with the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, which won the Nobel Peace Prize in uh, 2017. I just want to finish now by reading an excerpt from my book, which I hope just sort of draws some of this story together. It's a big story and I've only touched very lightly on its aspects, but hopefully this will help to bring it together. Emu Field is a tiny slice of a vast swathe of beautiful and wild central Australian territory a place that is intimidating in some ways owing to its hidden water and its unforgiving climate. Its traditional custodians traveled across this land for millennia, inveterate travelers that they were, always on the move. At the time of the tests, no one lived there permanently and no one can live there now. The fact that this pristine land was so casually handed over to a foreign power to test weapons of war speaks volumes about the reality of colonialism and its peculiar bonds. Many Aboriginal people lived within range of the Operation Totem toxins that were released without adequate warning or safety advice. It's still possible to find remnants of this remote and abandoned atomic test station, although they're not always obvious. 
The forgetting of Emu began as soon as the last serviceman and peace officer packed up their rough camps and headed home, away from the flies and the heat and the dust. The least visible but most dangerous residues are the wisps of long ago unleashed radioactivity and the immense human suffering and anxiety associated with them. This is Emu Field's secret, sorry and enduring legacy. And on that note, I would like to thank you very much for your attention and I'd be very happy to take your questions. Thank you. Oh, Liz, um, indeed, what a, a sorry and secret enduring legacy. Thank you so much um, for sharing that really deeply rich preview of your book on such an important topic. It's um, a pleasure and, a, and an honor. Um, Liz, we, we do have some questions. We do have, we have about 15 minutes, if that's okay. Um, and, and some have come in already. I have some too. Um, but we have one from Carly here, um, who is asking about the nature of, of secrecy um, around the files that you, you gave us a little bit of a story of, of how you were um, able to look into these declassified files, but now they're under review again. And she says, I'm so fascinated that they've delayed making these archives public and her mind is going wild with possibilities. Surely a journalist might like to know and have a bit of a look into it, um, even just to keep the pressure on. Um, we're just wondering if you can speculate a little bit more about the nature of that, that secrecy. Oh, that is such a great question. I'm really pleased with that. Actually, um, I have worked with an investigative journalist called James Griffith, Griffiths from CNN. He has written a couple of stories about it, and I've, I've contributed to a couple of stories about this. He did go seeking information about why those files were suddenly, without any warning at all, they were withdrawn um, in December 2018. Um, the official line is that they're under review um, for unspecified reasons. Um, some people think that they potentially are going to be moved from the British National Archives at Kew to a new archive that's being established, I believe, in Scotland. But that doesn't make sense because the new archive that's being established is more to do with civilian atomic energy rather than military atomic weaponry. So um, we don't really know why, and it does look very suspicious, though. I do have to say, though, that um, it was always, to me anyway, in my own research, it was it always seemed easier to get Maralinga files than it was to get EMU field files. So even before that mass withdrawal of, of files, um, what I would sometimes find is there'd be a juicy looking file in the, the catalogue of the National Archives in London. And I would either get that file and I would find, and I'd be reading, 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 and then I get to, and I'm thinking, I'm getting to the good bits. I'm about to find out exactly what that fuel was or whatever. And then there'd be a cardboard insert saying, part of this file has been redacted by the Ministry of Defence um, on this date. And it was usually sometime in the 90s. So in the 90s, when those earlier redactions took place, that, that could potentially be related to the fact that the Australian government was negotiating with the British government in 1992-93 for, um, for money to help pay for the remediation of um, particularly Maralinga. And ultimately that, um, that negotiation was more or less successful. The British coughed up less than half of what it actually cost, but at least they coughed up something because they'd been absolutely refusing to until then. So I suspect some of those earlier redactions were might, might have been related to that. Um, but the most recent redactions, I, I honestly don't know. And James Griffiths, who is a very, very good journalist, he has tried really hard to find out. Um, the atomic history community is kind of at a loss. We, we don't know. Um, we we talk about it among ourselves a bit, but um, we we really don't know. And but I do check regularly. And those uh, it's two main series, so it's the A, B, and E, S series, which are the main ones that deal with atomic weaponry. Um, they they're gone. We can't get them. Um, I already had some of those files, fortunately, from earlier. Um, so you know, 
I would like to go back in and have another look at some of them, but I can't. <laughs> so if anyone out there has an idea on what's going on, uh, I'd love to hear from you. Thanks, Liz. Um, we have a question here from Sean Ulm who um, asks, are there um, public statistics on wider health impacts of the tests, for example, um, on Defence Force personnel, um, observers and more distant um, non-Aboriginal settlements? We have a few questions about, about health impacts, but that's a very specific one. Yes, so there have been several studies of that. There was a big study, and off the top of my head, I can't remember exactly which year, but there was a big epidemiological study of the health effects on, um, on service personnel. Um, the, and off the top of my head again, I can't just remember all the, the details of that study. Um, but generally speaking, um, the British government in particular has never really accepted the um, uh, any sort of study that shows health effects, you know, adverse health effects to military personnel. Now, the Australian government, as some of you might be aware, has actually done marginally better. I'm, I'm not going to give them too many points, but they did marginally better uh, in that they did give both military personnel and civilians, including Aboriginal people, access to the gold card, so free healthcare from um, 2017, I think, um, was when that occurred. Um, there was a health study of Aboriginal people carried out in the early 1980s that was extremely inconclusive because of lack of baseline data. Um, there's been very patchy studies done. Most of the evidence um, has remained anecdotal and that makes it really difficult. Um, there have been a few studies though, and, and Sean, I will, I will fill you in on some of the detail. Off the top of my head, I, I, I might get some of that detail wrong if I try and remember it now. Um, and health, health effects are, are not really things that I've gone into very much myself, that being a fairly specialised area, but I can certainly point you in the right direction. So if you're interested in more on that, there have been some interesting things done. Just none, none of it has ever been terribly conclusive. That's the real problem. And that causes ongoing distress for those who are concerned, not just veterans and Aboriginal people, but their descendants as well. Thanks, Liz. Um, we have a few questions here as well um, about the environmental impacts. Um, Jill O'Sullivan asks if the, the soil is still radioactive. Another person um, asks about the groundwater um, uh, from that very vivid image that you showed um, of yourself standing on the clay pan where there was water seeping up. Um, is that radioactive or what, what were the water impacts of that? Um, and another person is asking, uh, about the lack of, of emus or wildlife um, and the implication that you perhaps were making that that's um, a consequence of these testings. Um, just wondering if you, you have anything to share with us about the environmental impact. Well, emu was never properly cleaned up and um, it's not, you're not allowed to stay there for very long because there is radioactivity. Um, at the ground zeros, you will find what is known as trinitite, which is, <laughs> When an atomic bomb is detonated, the heat is greater than the surface of the sun and it instantly turns the sand to glass. It's a, it's a strange kind of glass. And the glass, the trinitite at EMU, and in fact, you can see here on the screen, um, one of the plinths at um, ground zero for totem one, scattered all around there is this sort of black, weird glass, and that is radioactive. Um, they, they never really did much in terms of cleaning up this site. To get into this site now, you actually have to get special permission from um, the Defence Department, as well as from Maralinga Jarratjar jointly. You have to get permission from both, which reflects the fact that it isn't safe. The, um, the Oak Valley Rangers do go there, but they never stay for very long. Um, so you're not in immediate, at immediate risk. The cleanup report known as MARTAC did find that if you were to get a piece of trinitite and clip it with um, pliers to turn it to dust and inhaled that dust, you would probably 
experience a problem, but very few people are likely to do that. So just being there for a short time is, is probably okay. I can't speak about the water resources there, but I would speculate that they are probably affected as well. As for the animals, no one seems to know that the animals were plentiful um, before the tests. And indeed, that's how the place got its name from the emu claw marks. But these days, the animals stay away. Maybe they're canny about that. I, I don't know. And I, I don't claim any expertise in that area either. Um, but it was something that was quite noticeable when we were there that um, there were no animals. And I was expecting there would at least be kangaroos, but there weren't. So I can't give a good answer, I'm afraid, but it, it is kind of strange. Thanks, Liz. Um, we have a question about the, the legal implications of the testing. Um, has there been any attempt to um, have any kind of legal um, reparations um, or restoration here? Yeah. So the Royal Commission took place in the mid 1980s and returned an open verdict on the black mist, which was requested by the representatives of the Aboriginal people um, who were parties to the Royal Commission. And the reason for that um, was to, because the Royal Commission itself could not um, properly um, investigate or um, establish the facts around the black mist. So what then happened was the barristers representing the um, Aboriginal people then prepared uh, a brief of evidence um, and sought compensation from the Commonwealth. Um, and it took a few years, but ultimately they were successful. So um, it didn't end up going to court. It was settled out of court. So um, that was one thing. Um, also, the um, Aboriginal people got um, some compensation money. The, the community at Oak Valley got some compensation money more generally. In the mid-1990s, I think, um, totally inadequate amount, of course, you know, uh, considering what had happened to them, but there was some compensation paid to them from the Commonwealth as well, separate to that civil action that I, I mentioned from barristers from the Royal Commission. Um, in Australia, service personnel from Maralinga and EMU um, have attempted legal action. Only one was successful. That was a fellow who had been at Maralinga. He was the only one who succeeded at court. However, um, a, a number of people, over 100, um, did receive what is known as administrative compensation for injuries that were accepted as being part of their service. Um, British service personnel have a much worse time. Their government has never accepted uh, any liability. And as far as I know, um, no one has received any compensation among the British service personnel. And there are a lot more British than there were Australian. And I'm in regular contact with the British Nuclear Test Veterans Association that they're trying so hard to at least get recognition, even a medal, and it's something. <laughs> um, but the British government continues to deny them even the courtesy of a medal. Um, so that is very distressing for everyone involved. And of course, at this stage, most of the veterans are in their 80s and 90s. So, you know, it's getting late in the day. Okay, well, two, two last questions and I'll just um, hand them over to you at the same time, Liz. Um, one is, you've written about Maralinga already extensively. Why does Emu Field deserve its own spotlight, its own book? What's distinct about Emu Field? And then our last question is for you. What is next for you, Liz? You know, when Atomic Thunder, the, uh, the Maralinga story came out uh, in 2016, I was approached by many, many people, um, often, you know, fascinated by the story and wanting to talk more. And I'll never forget, I got a letter from someone who had a real interest and quite a bit of knowledge about these issues. And he said he loved Atomic Thunder, but um, he noticed that Emu Field is sort of brushed over and not mentioned very much, which is true. It was a footnote. It was not really looked at extensively. And he said, I want you to stop and think about what really went on at Emu. Um, and he gave me a few very suggestive questions about what I should be looking at. And I thought, 
that sounds really interesting. I'd never thought of that. It would not have occurred to me that um, that EMU was anything other than just a sort of a foretaste of Maralinga. But as the more I got into it, the more I realised just how extremely interesting and how uh, how different in some ways. Even the atmosphere is different to to Maralinga. So I got. I, I'm afraid EMU Field captured me and wouldn't let me go. So I uh, I have found it absolutely fascinating. I, and no one, as far as I can tell, has ever written uh, specifically about EMU. So there was a bit of a knowledge gap there, which I, I felt that I, I might be well placed to, to do. And just to very quickly answer your final question, I, um, I think I might go for the trifecta because the other nuclear test site, Montebello Islands off the coast of Western Australia, I think that's also crying out for a little bit of uh, history treatment. So that's where I'm headed next, I think, once I recover from this one. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. Um, on behalf of everyone here today, thank you for taking time to um, speak to us and share your presentation prior to the publication of your next book, um, your insights into the atomic tests at Emu Field and their effects on uh, the Maralinga, Jarecha, uh, the people of the Maralinga and Emu Fields and their lands um, represents really important work. And we wish you all the best with your forthcoming book. Thank you so much, Victoria. I'm, and thank you for being such a wonderful MC. I've, uh, I've really enjoyed working with you and sharing this story with you. So thank you to you and to everyone who's joined today. Thank you. And, and for everyone attending today, um, if I could please remind you in the audience um, to please complete the survey that opens in your browser after the webinar concludes. This helps us to continue to be able to deliver um, these kinds of webinars to you. Thank you, everyone, and have a lovely day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Liz. Bye.